Welcome to the HR on the Offensive podcast, brought to you by Lace Partners. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the latest HR on the Offensive podcast. It's me, Chris Howard from Lace Partners, joining you as always on this fabulous Thursday that we like to release our podcasts. Now, today's pod is a little bit of a news jack. I've decided that I wanted to get a couple of laces in to talk about a specific topic that I read about, but I think it's been in the press quite a lot in the last couple of months, maybe even earlier than that. The topic is around unbossing. And at first, when I saw this title, it was a Forbes article that I read, I thought to myself, is this just the latest kind of faddy catchphrase that somebody is trying to, you know, get a little bit of exposure to and trying to get a little bit of, well, in themselves, trying to go a bit influencer style, uh, you know, viral, that sort of thing. But there's some interesting sort of footnotes within the, uh, the, the title, the blog, the news story that I read. And so what I wanted to do is get two fabulous laces to come and have a chat with me about it, talk about What is unbossing, the pros, the cons? And I'll start with the man who has joined me, who is sitting next to me in our office today. It's uh, Marcus for our team. You all right? I'm very well, Chris. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Looking to get into the nub of this conversation. You and I both. Absolutely. Yes, certainly a big trend and keen to unpack it. Yep. 100%, 100%. 100%, 100%. And we've got Steph, who's uh, dialed in remotely. And Steph, are you feeling FOMO? Because uh, you're not in the office with us. I am a little bit, but it'll be fine. And hopefully plenty of people will have listened to the teaser that we put out earlier about this. Done. They might have done. So what Steph's referring to is we did a live stream. At the time of recording, it was this week. I'm saying this week, like people know. But um, just check out on YouTube or check out on our LinkedIn. You'll see the live stream. Steph and I did a five, ten minute about one pro, one con, and what is great unbossing. But if you haven't checked that out, then we're going to unpack it in a little bit more detail anyway. Now, before we get into this interesting topic in itself and I start firing some questions at you two fabulous people. One of the things that we, of course, like to do on this podcast is a completely random and fundamentally different question. I'm going to start with Steph on this one. My my fundamentally different question I'm posing to you as a bit of an icebreaker today, Steph, is that I saw an article which talked about a hotel chain that have just hired what they call a banter merchant. So this is for the Edinburgh Film Festival and that person kind of greeting guests as they arrive. So I quite liked the idea of that job title. Imagine putting that on your LinkedIn CV or something like that, but a banter merchant. So Steph, to kick us off, if you could uh, if you could either make up a job title for yourself or if you've come across an interesting job title that you just thought was quite humorous or funny, give us a little bit of a give us a little bit of a intel on an interesting job title that you think and then also explain what it is maybe to our listeners. Considering it's Wimbledon, and I'm going to keep that theme, I'm going to go with like a mopper of sweatness. So, <laughs> not necessarily for me, because I don't think I would fancy doing this job, but I do find it quite amusing to think that there could be somebody whose job it is, and you see those people that quickly run on with a towel and quickly dab, dab, dab somebody to kind of mop their brow or something like that. I like that. So I was thinking kind of job titles, which probably mean something else five, 10 years ago, but now somebody's just giving it a flashy title. So I've seen stuff like chief happiness officer. And it's like, what exactly is that? I feel like it's probably something to do with engagement or experience. Well-being. Or yeah. Well-being or something like that. But uh, Marcus, so you've got banter merchant. We've got a uh, mopper of sweat. Is it? Uh, what are you going for? Apollo, Chris. So I have uh, come across organizations who see a lot in the, the, the media or the agency sector where everyone across the uh, organization is a director. So what we call title inflation there. <laughs> and what I do like that perhaps the when you're first entering into the office, you meet with the director of first impressions. So we'll give a, a moment to think what, what a role that, that could actually be. Your director of first impressions. And that's your receptionist. That's who you register <laughs> with when you arrive in the office too. So everyone across the organization is a director. And the director of first impressions is the uh, receptionist or the office assistant. I love that. Director of First Impressions, a banter merchant, chief happiness officer, and then mopper of sweat. So there you go. If anybody's looking to take some inspiration on catchy job titles, we've just given you a bit of a leg up there. Now let's go on to 
the main topic of conversation, which is unbossing. I want to actually ask both of you guys this question. I'll start with you, Marcus. I mean, let's do a nice, easy one, which is let's just kind of set the scene, if you like, as to what we're talking about when we're talking about unbossing. <laughs> Good question, Chris. And when Steph and I were conducting our research into embossing, we found that there were two distinct definitions. So I'll tell you what those are, and then yep. I'll tell you which one we're going to use for the purposes of today. So embossing can mean or can refer to the elimination of roles at that middle management level. It might be called delayering mm -hmm. if we're using an organizational design lens, for example. Other definitions, and the one that we'll be using today, is rather than removing middle managers from the organizational structure, it's more changing the role of the middle manager. So becoming less your typical boss where you're telling someone what to do and the unbossing refers to that change in the relationship that the manager has with their reports. Uh, so we'll be using that one and we'll be talking a little bit more as to what that looks like and what are the conditions where a unbossed organisation might succeed a little bit later on. Cool. Wicked. Steph, anything to uh, add on that or just build on that in terms of this concept of unbossing? We did have a great analogy. <laughs> which I was going to use just to help bring this to life a little bit. And we were discussing about Gordon Ramsay when you watch The Kitchen Nightmares and goes into a restaurant and he's trying to help them improve the business. And you could see him strolling around, looking at the menu in the kitchen and the owner of the restaurant, who's like, yeah, like the manager is always in the kitchen, has to be in the chef, right, do something. And you can hear Gordon Ramsay going, just Get out of the kitchen. Just like you've hired these people, let them do their job. Get out of the kitchen. And, and this is what we're kind of thinking around the unbossing and repurposing the managers is like, get out of the kitchen and let like, your employees do their jobs and the work that they need to do. Stop hovering over them and micromanaging. So that's kind of what we wanted to use as a bit of an analogy just to bring it to life and an example for what we're going to go through next. Love it. And if Gordon Ramsay is listening in here to this podcast, please feel free. You've got a right of rebuttal mm -hmm. if you want to uh, discuss this concept of unbossing for us, certainly. So let's talk a little bit around pros and cons, because I think this is quite an interesting one. And I like the way that you talked about two different definitions there, because when I first kind of read this, I thought, OK, so basically it's dripping out the middle management layer, right? So there are good and bad sides to that. You've got communications, you've got transparency, lack of transparency businesses might feel. You've got, oh, well, who do I now talk to? Because I'm now not speaking to my line manager. I'm actually speaking to somebody who's more senior. How much time do I get? So there's a lot of nuances in there. Let's focus in on your definition now, which is around the relationship side and talk about some pros and cons. And shall we go uh, one pro for both of you, then one con, one con? Should we do that? Do that um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. We'll start with, uh, I'll start with you, Marcus, then. But I do think this is an interesting topic because as with all of these things it's very nuanced isn't it it's not just right well let's do some unbossing and this is this is the pod this is this is the positive impact of it there's a lot of things to consider in there very much so chris and uh, unbossing may not be the right solution for all organizations yeah. dependent on the sector dependent on their maturity and uh, steph and i will talk a little bit more as to what are the cultural aspects that need to be considered if an organization is, is looking to unboss but in terms of one of the key benefits that comes from unbossing and uh, again if your line manager is not hovering over you mm -hmm. and uh, telling you what you need to do and monitoring every uh, movement to use a bit like the gordon ramsay kitchen nightmares example there a greater sense of autonomy that uh, team members are able to get on with their work. They are able to use their initiative. They feel more empowered as a result of being uh, given greater control over the work that they do. And with that comes a greater sense of engagement. And uh, other organizations have uh, famously linked engagement with an increased level of productivity and increased financial performance for the organization. So there's a big go after if the conditions are right to put uh, an unbossing solution in place. Okay, Steph, got a pro for us? I have. And I think lots of people were great at this when COVID first hit, that all of a sudden everybody was working from home and a lot of red tape disappeared and decisions were kind of made faster. And gradually you keep hearing stories more about coming back into the office. And I think some of this on Boston is kind of trying to get back to 
that improved efficiency and agility and that ability to be able to like pivot and make decisions quickly. So by repurposing that layer of management, the decision making processes can be more streamlined, which then obviously will lead to faster responses to any kind of market changes. There'll be better communication flows between leaders and frontline workers. So I think if you could do this properly and really great, you can get back to some uh, faster decision making and quicker agility within your structures. I don't want to invoke the whole pandemic, COVID, because it feels like, I know that was a massive, it was almost like a line in the sand for many organisations, mm-hmm. but it is quite interesting you've picked up that almost pre-COVID, post-COVID, kind of how the dynamics have changed. Do you want to do another pro? Yes, absolutely. So looking at potential uh, cost savings. So typically, an organization that's looking to unboss would have the managers responsible for a larger number of, of team members than, than perhaps before there. So as a result of the line managers taking a responsibility for, for larger teams, granting them that uh, sense of empowerment, that sense of, uh, of focus and uh, ownership over the work that they do, there is a potential to then remove some of the administrative costs, some of that more transactional work as well, and then free the line managers and the teams to focus more on that relationship and that more value-add work. So not just the increased engagement and the increased productivity that that I spoke about uh, just a moment ago, but also enhanced cost savings through reducing the amount of time that's spent on administrative or transactional work that will move away through this greater sense of empowerment that line managers are granting their teams. Yeah, I feel like some of the pros and some of the cons are almost going to be mirrors of themselves because obviously we're talking about, and we'll get to the cons in a second. I think we'll do the pros first and I'll, I know because you guys got a couple more. But well anticipated, it's quite Chris, absolutely, yes. It's quite interesting because like that engagement side, yes, you can get empowered a little bit more, but there's probably an argument as well, which is engagement can be a challenge because you've got, as we, I talked about a minute ago, you've suddenly got, oh, well, who do I now go to? And it's more difficult to get through to those people. But I don't want to flip into the cons just yet. So Steph, Any others that you've got on your list in terms of some of the benefits of unbossing? I know we've spoken about the cost savings, the engagement, the agility and efficiencies. But within all of that, I guess there's a path of that greater financial performance as well. So there is the article on HBR. They said they found that companies who managers excelled around those people, metrics and being more supportive and more coach like had high returns and they were four times more likely to have long-term financial performance than other organizations as well so i do think there are some great benefits that do go with this yeah definitely and some interesting examples that were in the forbes article itself as an advantage one as well let's Let's go on to this because I feel like I teased our audience a little bit. We're talking about the cons because as we talked about, it's not, it's, this is a nuanced discussion. It's not just there are only benefits. Every business is different. I'd love to get your take as well on whether or not you guys think, I guess, from a industry perspective. And you kind of touched on it as well, Marcus, didn't you? That no two businesses are alike. And so this isn't just a panacea, which is, hey, I'm bossing the de-layering side or the relationship side that you talked about, this has only got pros. So let's let's look at some of those cons, if you like. And with that lens of no two organisations are created alike and does it differ between industries or the type of business that you are? But do you want to uh, just kind of give us some thoughts from a, a cons perspective? Yes, absolutely. So I'll talk a little bit about one or two of the, the cons to unbossing and then I'll ask Steph to talk to what are the types of organisations where potentially unbossing has a greater chance of of being Mm -hmm. successful there and touch upon another big trend that uh, a lot of people might have been hearing which is that of quiet quitting. Mm -hmm. So if you think of unbossing where your manager is granting you greater autonomy, greater ownership over your work is not hovering over you and and checking that you're doing your work, it does open itself up for quiet quitting. If If you're not engaged and your manager is not checking in on you constantly, you can get away with doing the minimum and potentially that being undiscovered for for longer. So whilst we we spoke about engagement is one of the advantages of unbossing and having that greater sense of ownership for your work, it can also be a way of masking someone's lack of engagement because your manager may not pick up on it as quickly as if they were more actively involved and checking in with you more regularly during what might be a more 
typical management style relationship with their direct reports. Yeah, Steph? I totally agree with everything you're saying there, Marcus. And just to add an example to that, in one of my previous in-house roles that I've had, where I was covering or somebody who had left, so I was taking on a um, couple of teams. And the biggest bit of feedback that I got within that is that people just wanted more time with me. And because you're so stretched, you just couldn't spend time with the team as much because they people do want development. They do want to be coached. And if you are stretched across other stuff, then I agree totally with what you're just saying there, Marcus, that there is that possibility where some people, if they don't feel like they're being invested in or getting that time with you to help their development, they can kind of switch off a little bit, which could lead into quite within but one of the other cons is I think the potential for chaos as well so if you haven't got a sufficient structure in place and we know in some organizations they can have quite complicated structures as well there can be some confusion over people's roles and responsibilities which then could lead to some inefficiencies within the structure and have that potential for conflict which then could create some chaos within the department as well. Do you want to do another con? Yes, I want to talk a little bit more about what, what Stephanie alluded to around yeah, that uh, lack of, of development and progression. So line managers and, and middle managers play a vital role in checking in with their employees and ensuring that they have a clear sense as to where they're going within the organization, what their development aspirations are, the opportunity to progress. They often serve as coaches and mentors. So if they're not checking in as regularly, or if they are more stretched because they're managing a wider number of people or a greater number of people, there is the potential for that lack of sense of, of development and lack of sense of progression. And what we do know from the research is that lack of career progression, lack of career development is one of the key reasons why people may quite quit or may actively quit. And it can be a key contributor to attrition. And where it can be more acutely felt is amongst your, your generation Z and for those that are regarded as top talent within the organization mm -hmm. that have a greater expectation of being able to grow, develop, be stimulated, be challenged within their role. If their middle manager or their line manager is inaccessible or isn't giving them that degree of focus and attention and allowing them to, to develop and, and build their career, they can either react by quiet quitting or they can vote with their feet and look for other organizations that do give them those development opportunities. So there is that risk there. Totally agree, Marcus. And I think what we're saying here is actually one of the key stuff is your manager's capability. So thinking about how do you supercharge your line managers to turn them from being a manager to being a leader as such. So therefore, we know that not all managers may possess the necessary skills to transition from that supervisory role to be more hands off. So you have to really invest in your capability of your people managers to get this right, or it could lead to all those things that we've just spoken about. Yep, absolutely. So we've got about five, 10 minutes left to go. I do want to get into a couple of examples of where it's done right or where it's done less successful, if you like. I know, obviously, you've mentioned a couple of examples, including, Steph, your own sort of personal example. So I'll stick with you for the next uh, con, if you like. But if, if there are any other cons, I want to just kind of wrap up if there are any other kind of final cons that you guys can think of before we go into, well, this is an example of where it's done well or whether it's done less well. So any kind of final thoughts on the uh, the cons of it? I going to say that there is maybe difficulty in measuring performance. So I know we said that about repurposing, kind of managed to be more leaders, coach, mentors, likewise. But with that, if you are increasing your spans of control to do that, it can be challenging to maintain that consistent performance standards across and then back to having those frequent check-ins as well, which then could lead to some kind of unfairness between what people are doing within the team and how you're measuring the success as well of how people are performing. Yeah, 100%. Marcus, any kind of thoughts? So you can have a build on that or you can pick another con out? I will pick another con as well. It's And it, it also segues into perhaps one of the some of the conditions that are required as well. So mm. Stephanie's alluded to it, but it's not just a switch that you can flick to take that decision to unboss. It requires a significant commitment financially, a developmentally to your line managers because we're 
creating and we're building a new set of skills and capabilities that requires an incredible amount of vulnerability amongst your, your middle managers, self-awareness, the creation of a feedback culture. And one of the organizations that's most progressed in this journey is, is Novartis. And mm. this is a multi-year journey with a lot of learning interventions, a lot of time spent with their line managers and a great investment in them to be able to build the culture and build the capability amongst the line managers to then be able to reap the benefits of unbossing there. So it's not a decision that you take lightly, nor is it a decision that could be taken quickly in the benefits realized quickly. So I talked to earlier, a, a little bit earlier when we were just before we were going into the con section around this idea that no two businesses are created alike. I'm quite interested in just picking at this a little bit, if that's all right. I'll start with you, Steph, because I think it's important to recognize that, and as you said, Marcus, right at the start, this isn't going to be right for everyone. And there is no one size fits all. It's not just right now, I've read an article and now we're going to delayer or we're going to unboss our entire middle management uh, level. So, Steph, can you just talk me through a, a couple of points or a couple of thoughts uh, and then I'll get Marcus to build on it around this idea of no two businesses are created equal. You've got industry sectors as well. So it will be different for different industry sectors as well, right? Yeah, totally. And when Marcus and I was doing our research and having lots of conversations about this, we really thought, oh, this really isn't a one size fits all approach and when we started thinking about well where would we see this working or not working we felt as if I take a tech startup for example they often have flatter structures they require more rapid innovation and flexibility then like there's more creativity so that less hierarchical approach probably lends itself well to this unbossing culture compared to say a manufacturing I said where you've got like lots of health and safety regulations there's probably lots of like red tape there's lots of having to comply with certain quality controls so when you start thinking about all those layers of process and check-in you probably do need more supervision so therefore oh it might not work very well there and one of the other areas that we thought oh this might and Boston might lean itself towards his knowledge workers as well and we thought that it could be better suited to those organized where there are more automations the work's a bit more predictable so we could we started kind of formulating a little bit like oh this is where we think it could work really well compared to some of the complexities in other organizations where it might struggle to land yeah I think this is a really interesting one particularly when you talk about the size of business as well. So a business that has only got 50 people in, it's going to be a lot easier to make those connections and to collaborate. And you may not need that middle layer. But when you go into a business that's like 10,000 size, mm -hmm. multiple office locations, for example, it's going to be really different, right? <laughs> Very much so, and also drives that risk of potential silos being created yeah. as okay. well in those larger, more complex organisations. So Steph mentioned previously those organisations that have a driver of wanting to be agile, that need to change very quickly, that need to pivot. Those are the types of organisations where unbossing and where there's a greater sense of empowerment, a greater sense of ownership, a greater sense of ability to pivot might be worthwhile. Those organizations where consistency and the roles are very structured, very routine, and the output of the organization might be a product, so a production line, or if you think of a heavy maintenance type environment where quality and consistency is the driver, unbossing may not be the right solution for that organization. Yeah, you can't have the MD going around checking everybody's uh, doing the old quality control check. Indeed, <laughs> nor if you're, say, working in a uh, doing maintenance for an airline, can you yeah. grant people the initiative to do things their own way? There are standard operating procedures, there are quality controls in place. So unbossing may not be the right solution for an organization such as that. No, exactly right. Guys, I want to, um, we've got probably a few more minutes left. So let's talk about, and I think you guys had talked about it when we were doing the prep for this, like the conditions for success, like when it's done well. So Steph, we'll kick you off. Any final sort of thoughts around when it's done well, what are, what are those conditions for success? Some of the things that we believe that you need to have within your organization to make this work are a strong organizational culture. So that foundation of trust, 
the transparency between management and employees is already there um, because employees need to feel trusted to be able to make decisions and for them to be empowered and take ownership of their work. If you're starting from a base where employees, you've got low engagement, low levels of trust, you need to really work on that first before you even think about unbossing. Yep, certainly, Marcus. The culture is key to be able to successfully realise the benefits of unbossing. So there needs to be a culture where middle managers feel that they can be vulnerable, that they can be themselves, that they're self-aware, that there is a strong culture of feedback. And to be able to create that culture, there needs to be that sense that line managers want to understand what are they doing well, what could they improve on, own that feedback, and then act upon that. So it, there is a piece around organizational maturity, a culture that values authenticity, vulnerability, uh, psychological safety as a foundation to then explore unbossing and uh, as the, a potential solution. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got about a minute or two left. So I, I want to do kind of like an any final thoughts from you guys? Anything maybe we haven't covered regarding this topic of unbossing before we uh, we hit the stop button on today's podcast? Uh, Marcus, any kind of final bits you want to just pick up on? Anything that you want our listeners to take away from today's chat? Sure, Chris. Uh, so thank you for, for listening in as well. I think it's fair to say that we are very early on in our journey around unbossing. So mentioned Navartis a couple of times that is perhaps the most visible and the most progressed along that journey. So we are expecting that this focus on unbossing will continue, especially as it, uh, there is an increased focus on AI, automating routine tasks that then unlock the potential for unbossing. But it is early days, so we're still waiting for more research and more results to be delivered of those organizations that have embarked on the unbossing journey. Yeah, this is a complex conversation. It's a complex discussion. It's a lot more nuanced, nuanced than, oh, cool, we can just do this now, right? So Steph, any kind of final thoughts for you before we wrap up today? The last bits from me is just as workplace continue to evolve and there's that significant shift in the leadership philosophy I just think that you just need to be careful and consider all the conditions that you have within your organization to ensure that you could have a successful implementation if this is what you're thinking of going through step back assess and really think about it before you actually decide to go for it yeah, take that time to ask yourself the question, is this really right for us? Really, really good yeah. stuff. We are just out of time for today. I just want to say, Steph, thank you very much for uh, jumping on and uh, recording today's pod. Thank you for having me. Yeah, always good to have you on. And Marcus, making your debut. Thank you, Chris. Delighted to be here. Yeah, good to have you. So if you want to catch any of our podcasts, we've also got the live stream you can check out, but we do a lot of different topics, um, which some of which we do kind of cross over on the live stream, but some of which we do are independent to that. So please feel free to like, subscribe, follow us, really follow us on your podcast channels from myself, from Marcus and from Steph today. Thank you very much for listening and hopefully we'll catch you next time on the HR on the Offensive Podcast. Bye-bye.